Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ralph Christie, director of CFAT, and I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker today. Uh, but when I think about this audience, uh, your uh, experiences in uh, international development, the agriculturalist among you, uh, and I think about the career path of our speaker, uh, perhaps he needs no introduction. Uh, perhaps I should simply present him. But that left me in a quandary because I wasn't quite sure where to begin. So I, I thought it would be safe if I would begin in Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh, where I first uh, met the speaker back in 1998, I believe. Uh, he was incoming uh, president of the Rockefeller Foundation and the Rockefeller staff uh, that Bob Hurd had organized to have a meeting in Oaxaca was in full anticipation of the new president. Uh, this new president, uh, the vice uh, chancellor of the University of Sussex, uh, a person who, uh, who started his career several decades ago uh, in the area of agricultural ecology, uh, the new president who had uh, g given pioneering thoughts uh, to the idea of sustainable development. That might be a new word for some of you here. But sustainable development uh, is, is, is the area that he worked on and pioneered, if you will. And so it was with full in in anticipation we, we awaited the new president and a, a gentleman from England, and we didn't quite know, some of us, what to expect. He arrived without luggage. He immediately bought a local T-shirt that says, I am from Oaxaca, <laughs> uh, and he began to engage us. Instantly, uh, we gained his confidence. He trusted the staff. He was a leader, he had vision. Uh, he was a person that uh, had tremendous ideas and listening and sharing. And uh, he had a, went on to have a wonderful tenure as president of the Rockefeller Foundation. In 2005, he returned to the UK as a senior uh, scientific advisor to DFIT. Uh, and now, most recently, uh, is president of, uh, he's a professor at the Empirical College University. Uh, he's written several books, but I would be remiss if I did not bring to your attention his latest book, uh, which is the title of our seminar today, uh, One Billion Hungry, uh, Can We Feed the World? And this is a, a phenomenal read. If you're interested in getting the book, there are order forms here that we can make available to you. We'll leave them on the front, uh, on the front table here. Uh, there's one other thing that always intrigued me about our speaker is that he got his PhD from California Davis. And I thought that was a really interesting thing to do for a person from the UK to come to California. And I think perhaps that explained a lot of uh, his leadership, his approachability, uh, his sense of sensitivity, and his sense of culture uh, and for many of the places that he's worked. So ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, it is my real distinct pleasure to introduce to you Professor Sir Gordon Conway. Gordon? Uh, just a minute, I've got to turn on all the mics. As you can see, I'm double mic'd. I've never been double mic'd before. <laughs> it's like being double dated, I think, or something like that. Uh, okay? Yeah, I got a thumbs up. I'm, I'm live. <laughs> great to be here. It's great to be in Cornell. Uh, I've had associations with Cornell for years, right back to the days when Cornell was in that tremendous partnership with the University of the Philippines in Los Banos in the, in the 1960s. And, uh, but I've, I've only been here two or three times, but I've had this long association with Cornell people. And it's wonderful to see so many of them in the audience and to be introduced by my good friend Ralph here. So it's, it's, great, it's great to be here. Uh, and I'm also delighted, by the way, that a number of the Cornell University Press have come here. Uh, they've spent two years working on my book, and we'd never met until now. It's a slightly odd thing, you know, having this relationship right across the Atlantic with people who've got your baby, as it were, and are nurturing it. So we've had a very good day with them. 
and I'm very grateful to them for putting the book together. Now the book's title is One Billion Hungry, Can We Feed the World? And uh, the question is, can we feed the world? And the answer is yes. Now for all of those who came here just because you wanted to hear the answer, you can now go. Uh, but of course, the yes is qualified. And in the last chapter of the book, there are 24 qualifications. Now I know that many of you are students and you're busy writing notes and I just say, don't write notes, just listen and buy the book. <laughs> it's better for you and it's better for me if you, if you buy the book. If we think about those qualifications, we end up with four routes to food security. Innovation, markets, people, and political leadership. Four ways of going ahead. And I want to illustrate those with, uh, and how they interact with each other, a little story about the new rices in Africa, the Nericas. These rices are a cross between the Asian species of rice and the African species of rice. And Africans themselves have done these crosses over the last couple of hundred years, but they're very difficult to do. And Monty Jones, who's a great uh, Sierra Leonean uh, scientist, uh, was struggling to make the cross using tissue culture. In other words, making a culture and putting the embryo in it and seeing if it grows. And he was having real difficulty. And he came to us at the Rockefeller Foundation. I don't know whether he came to Bob Hurt there, who's sitting there. And he, Bob just nodded to me. So it was Bob. And Bob said, hmm. He said, uh, I don't know. He said, I know what you should do. You should go and see the Chinese. They'll tell you what to do. So Bob at Rockefeller Foundation, we were very generous. And he, he bought. I think probably an economy return ticket to China for, for Monty. And Monty went to China and he said to the Chinese, look, I've got these cultures, and I can't get the embryo to grow. And they said, oh, why don't you put some coconut oil in the culture? And he put coconut oil in and it worked. And really in a way that was the most cost effective grant we ever gave at the Rockefeller Foundation. <laughs> You know, so about $300, we, we changed, changed the world. These crosses are quite remarkable. Now, most of you who are Asians in this room will look at that picture and say, what on earth are those Africans doing in an Asian rice field? Well, it's not an Asian rice field. It's an African rice field in Uganda. And those are Ugandan boys. And look at the field of rice. What happens is that with the cross between the African and the Asian rice, it combines the best of both. And the African rice swamps out the weeds, and it uh, is very good for the local environment. It, 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 it's resistant to pests and diseases. And then as it grows up, it produces the high yields similar to the Asian rice, three, three four tons per hectare. We thought that having produced it, we could go away and do something else because it would just spread from farmer to farmer because it's a self-pollinated crop. It would just go from farmer to farmer. And it didn't. And one of the things we learned was that you need markets. You need markets to make something get out there. And lo and behold, in Uganda, they discovered that the Indian population in Kenya liked the new rice. So now the Ugandans are growing this rice to sell to Kenyans in India. So you've got a targeted market. You've got very bright people, such as Monty Jones doing the work, and you have political leadership. You've got on the one hand the political leaders who supported this research from the UK, the US, Japan in particular. And you've also got the leadership of, of the president of Uganda, Yoweri Museveni. So all those things came together to make this successful. 
Now, let's remind us of what we face today. First of all, recurring food price spikes. Secondly, the fact that there's about a billion people in the world who are hungry. And thirdly, we've got to feed the world by 2050. Since 2007, we've had spikes in prices. The price suddenly starts to go up of food, reaches a peak, comes down again, crashing down. But never quite down to where it was before. Even more significant is it doesn't come down so fast or so far in developing countries. It sticks up. And that's where the impact is so great. For us in the West, it's, you know, we get a bit fed up with the fact that prices go up. But for poor families who spend most of their income on food, it's a disaster. We think this latest spike, which is the one we're in right now, that little blip at the far right up there, is the begin beginning of a new spike. It went up, food went up 6% in July, was level in August, went up 1.7% last month. But we're not quite sure. Because the spikes are a result of many factors. First of all, a perception or a reality of shortage of grain. Secondly, the impact of biofuels that are increasing biofuel crops are increasing food crop prices all the time. Thirdly, panic buying and export bans. And fourthly, a degree of financial speculation. All of those come together to produce these food price spikes. We think We've got some control over it and it's moderating, but that's what's there. What we do know that we need is much better regional trade. We need to be able to get to a situation where Kenyans and Ugandans and Rwandans and Tanzanians can easily move grain between them. But more fundamentally, what they're showing is that we have to produce more food. Over the last 10, 15 years, there have been many years in which the supply of grain has been below the demand. We need more food. And we need to get over these spikes because of the food price riots. You look at the bottom there, that graph shows the number of riots as a function of food prices. The correlation is extraordinary. And it was certainly food prices that one of the factors in the Arab Spring at the beginning. And then, there's the issue of a billion hungry. Now, I know some of you have already looked at the press and you realize that FAO has published a report on the day the book was launched that said actually there's only 800 and whatever it is, million people. I got an email of congratulation that I'd reduced the number of hunger by 130 million in one day by publishing the book. <laughs> I wish to God that was true. Uh, but you need to read the fine print, which is that the 833 million is calculated on the basis of a sedentary lifestyle. You know, most of you are students, you know what a sedentary lifestyle is, <laughs> and you're all practicing it like mad right here. But actually, if you were active, it would be 1.25 billion. And if you are a farmer, it gets even more. Anyway, it's roughly a billion. We've been joking with Cornell University Press about the title. Now, maybe we should have said, we think there are probably about 800 to 1 billion hungry people in the world, colon, can we feed the world? But, you know, you don't sell books that way. <laughs> Look at what is interesting. 30% of the population of Africa are hungry, but so is 30% of the population of India. It's not just in Africa where the hunger is. It's elsewhere too. And the most appalling statistic in all of this, the really appalling statistic, is that about 180 million children in the world are chronically malnourished. They're under the height they should be for their age, which means they are stunted. It means that they die or they go blind or they don't develop properly. They don't develop intellectually, they don't develop mentally, they don't develop socially in the way that they should. And all of that happens in the first thousand days of life. In other words, sorry, 
yes, in the first thousand days of life, in the uh, pregnancy period in, in, in the womb, and then for the two years afterwards. And that's when you have to do something about it. And if you don't do something about it, then the child has had it for the rest of the life. Thirdly, we have to feed the world by 2050. And there's a whole range of challenges there, and you know, this, is, this could be the beginning of a whole series of lectures which um, others in the audience can give you, so I'll, I'll leave it to them. But I just want to pick out a few key issues. One of them is that most people think that the big problem is population increase, that we're going to go to 9.5 billion by 2050. And I think that's what's causing all the problem. Well, it, it is a challenge, but we could more or less do it if that's all that we had to do, feed the extra mouths. The problem is this. As countries become better off, as people become better off, as incomes rise, diets change. So in China, and in India, and in Brazil, and Korea, and Vietnam, and so on, those countries, people are adopting Western-style diets. They eat what all you guys eat, bags of crisps and chips, you know, with a little bit of tomato ketchup and so on. And they eat bread and wheat products. And they eat livestock products. They eat meat and eggs and poultry, yogurt, all that stuff. And the problem, of course, is that if you feed livestock, you need grain to feed livestock. Very crudely, and it's very crude, you need about eight kilos of grain for every kilo of meat that you produce. So you've got competition if you're growing corn between maize, for those of us in Britain. If you're growing corn, you can sell it for human food or animal food. The Chinese have just done a deal with the Ukraine. They've given a loan of $3 billion to Ukraine in return for exports of up to 5 million tons of grain. That's the way the world is shifting. And of course, also, there's the growing demand for biofuels. If you grow this maize or corn, there's competition for food and feed, but there's also competition for maize that goes into biofuel to produce ethanol. So the price of maize is very sensitive now, and it knocks on to other crops. And part of the trouble is that, with all due respect to any of you who are farmers growing maize in this country, maize is not a really great fuel producer of a biofuel. Neither is oil palm. In fact, we're locked into this first generation of biofuel crops that really are not what we should be doing. We should be moving into second, third generation, using things like Jotropha or uh, miscanthus, using wastes, using algae. And we need much more research, urgent research to do it. It's going to be a real tragedy if 20 years from now we don't need oil palm anymore for producing biodiesel. And we could say, oh, it's all right now. You can convert all that oil palm plantations back to primary forest in Indonesia or the Congo or wherever else. There are many challenges of supply. The problem of fertilizer prices, the problem of land degradation, the problem of water degradation, both those degradations caused by overuse, inefficient use, competition, pollution, and so on. And I can talk about all those, but I won't now. But just simply to say, on top of all of that is climate change. And we know what's going to happen. The growing seasons in Africa, over much of Africa, are going to get shorter. I was in Ghana last year, and the rains came in northern Ghana. The rains came a month late and finished a month early. 
Left a hundred days. There was only one variety of rice they could grow. And then the temperature's going up. There's been a fascinating study of 2,000 trials of growing uh, corn, maize in, in Africa. And they all show that for every degree day above 30 degrees, you lose 1.7% of the final yield. So if the temperature is 31 degrees on a day, you'll lose 1.7% of that yield. If it's two de 32 degrees, you'll lose 3.4% and so on. It's a huge amount. And there are many more phenomena like that that's going to affect us. And on top of that, we're going to have extreme events. This is the graph by Jim Hansen that shows that the mean of the temperature is shifting. You see it moving to the right so that the, the, the average temperature is moving. This is f uh, further across to the right. And the shape of the curve is changing too. So beyond that lower limit of extreme heat there, you can see the high proportion of times when an extreme event will occur. And we will get more... Oh. We will get more of those extreme events that we had, for example, in 2010 when we had the huge heat wave in Russia and the tremendous rainfall in Pakistan, which were both a product of the same weather system. Nobody can prove that that was a consequence of climate change, but it's the kind of phenomenon that the models of climate change suggest are going to happen. So that's what's in front of us. That's the challenge of feeding the world by 2050. FAO says we need to increase by 70%. I think that if we have to produce the kind of reserves we're going to need to cope with these extreme events, we're probably going to need to double food production. So how do we do it? Well, I've already talked about how we do it. Innovation, markets, people, political leadership. Let's start with innovation. And the good news, of course, is there's a lot of innovation there already. Africans have been far more innovative about the use of, of, of uh, mobile phones than anybody else in the world. And the mobile phone networks in Africa are fantastic. I was in northern Ghana, as I said. And I went out to the east, and I went up the dirt road to the border of Togo. And I got out my phone and I called my wife. And she said, hi, how are you? Immediately. You know. She said, where are you? I said, I'm up here in northern Ghana on the border of Togo. I said, where are you? She said, I'm up in northern Thailand on the border of the Shan states and I'm just going to go across. Now, for many of the younger ones in the audience, at any rate, those of you who don't come from Cornell, where I gather that the phone reception is dreadful, <laughs> um, that is not remarkable, but I think it's remarkable. And of course, Africans have used that capacity to do all kinds of things, in particular, marketing food security. The big challenge, though, this is why it's so important, this is why innovation is so important, is that we don't just have to increase food security. We've also got to conserve natural resources, and we've also got to reduce greenhouse gases. We need win-win-wins. It's not easy. And the way that we talk about that these days is this concept of sustainable intensification. That what we need to do is more with less. That's the simplest view. There's no more pristine arable land out there. There's bits and pieces of it, but virtually no more. If we're going to produce more food, we've got to produce it on the same amount of land as we have now. And we must produce more food need increased yields, same amount of land, less water, less fertilizer, less pesticides, lower emissions of nitrous oxide, methane, and carbon dioxide. Greater productivity, smaller footprint. That is a challenge. That's a real challenge. Big one. For all of you who are going into the science of agriculture, this is what you're going to be working on uh, for the next few years. Let me illustrate it. Mrs. Namarunda, uh, 
a lady we more or less invented, doesn't really exist. A woman in Kenya, her husband died, she's got a son who's come here because a photo is being taken and he's turned up from Nairobi. Uh, he turns up with a bit of money from time to time, but not much. And she's got four kids and she can barely feed them. She's got a hectare of land. She struggles. And you look on the left there, she starts off with grain that will give her two tons per hectare, but along come the weeds, the insects, diseases, the drought, and she ends up with less than a ton per hectare. And with that, she can't feed them, she doesn't have any money. But if she starts off with grain that will produce maybe three tons per hectare, and she controls the weeds and the insects and the diseases and the drought, she ends up with two tons per hectare, she can feed her family with maybe one ton, sell the other ton, or she can plant another crop like bananas or coffee or whatever it happens to be. And she can get some income. And she needs income. She needs income, otherwise the kids don't go to school. And if she hasn't got income, they won't get medicines. They need cash. So the question is, how do you make that happen? Well, there are lots of various technologies. And one of the messages of the book is that any technology can be appropriate. You need to put aside your prejudices about technologies. It can be traditional or intermediate, conventional or a platform technology. It just depends upon whether it's appropriate for those local conditions, for the social, economic, environmental conditions where the farmer is, where Mrs. Namurunda is. Is it appropriate for Mrs. Namurunda? Forget whatever you've been reading in Western newspapers or on the television. Is it appropriate for her? One example called microdosing, where instead of broadcasting fertilizer all across the field, you put fertilizer in the top of a Coca Cola, Pepsi Cola, or whatever kind of cola you drink, top. And you put that in the hole where you're going to plant the seed. And that way, you use a small amount of nitrogen but it works in the right place. It's the equivalent of precision farming on the most advanced farms in the United States, but for the developing country. Another example, this is more complicated. There's a terrible weed called striga, this beautiful purple plant. Just to remind you that just because it's beautiful doesn't mean it's good, right? It causes billions of dollars of damage. It's a parasitic plant. One approach, the lady in the top there, is growing a legume called desmodium between the maize plants. And that desmodium will kill the striga. It produces chemical toxin that kills the striga. An alternative, illustrated in the bottom right, is that we've now got a mutant form of maize produced by tissue culture that is tolerant of a herbicide called demasipir. The Mazipir kills the striker, but it also kills the maize, except for this variety. So what they're doing now is taking the seed, the bottom right there, and treating it with the Mazipir. And when the seed is sown and it grows up, it kills the striker. Instead of spraying the whole field with herbicide, you're using a very small amount of herbicide on the seed, and it works. That really, those two illustrate two approaches towards food security. One is agroecological, and the other is through plant breeding. One agroecological approach are home gardens, the top left there. In Java, people, mostly women, plant around their houses a great variety of plants. They create a little miniature forest. They have coconuts, they have bananas, they have fruit trees, they have all these things growing in the garden. And as a result, they get better nutrition because they're growing nutritive foods around the house. It's one way of countering that problem of child malnutrition. You can contrast that with that picture at the bottom right in Java, in, sorry, in, in Ethiopia, where the government had resettled people down from the hills. Little huts, built in barren land, scrawny, 
chickens. The question is, can we move, as it were, the concept of home gardens from Java to Ethiopia? Another agricultural ecological solution is something called a tree phytherbia. Phytherbia, you can see growing there, is a leguminous tree which has the extraordinary habit of dropping its leaves in the wet season. Not in the dry season, in the wet season. And so you can grow maize under the trees and you'll get three tons per hectare because the tree is a leguminous tree. And the nitrogen comes from the leguminous tree. But more than that, the tree puts carbon back into the soil. So you're getting two, maybe four tons of carbon per hectare put back into the soil. So you're getting your win-win-wins in that way. The problem, though, with all the agroecological approaches is that they're often demanding of skill and they're often demanding of labor. And I'm an ecologist and I love the fact that we could solve everything through agricultural ecology. But it's not a magic bullet. It works in many places, but it varies from place to place according to the environment. And it has to be complemented by modern plant breeding. We have to somehow try and build into the seed the sustainable intensification. We need new varieties of seed which not only produce higher yields, but are less demanding on the environment in terms of the plant that they produce. So we need to breed for more nutritious plants. We need to breed for plants that are more resilient to pest diseases and climate change. And the big challenge is to breed plants that are more efficient, in particular, at taking up nitrogen from the air. The holy grail here is to have crops like wheat and maize and barley and so on that have got the equivalent of the legumes root nodules in them. The bacteria that fix the nitrogen from the atmosphere inside them. We can do a great deal by conventional breeding. The top there are orange flesh sweet potato, which has been very successful in Uganda, Mozambique, being produced by conventional breeding, and is very valuable in reducing child malnutrition. The big problem is weaning. When mothers wean their babies, in many developing countries, in many places, they take the staple crop, such as sweet potato, mash it up very fine and feed it. In Asia, they often take the rice and the milky liquid on the top of the rice after you've cooked it, which looks like milk, but isn't milk. It's got carbohydrates, some protein, but it doesn't have in it vitamin A, zinc, iron these key micronutrients that stop children from dying or becoming blind. So we need it in the rice. The problem with having, say, vitamin A in the rice is that the genes aren't there in the rice plant to, for it to happen. And so in that situation, you're having to bring genes from out, outside and to produce a genetically engineered rice plant, which is called golden rice on the left. And I was in Uganda just last month. Uganda is now the leading country doing research on genetically engineered plants in Africa. It's extraordinary what they're doing. And I was walking through the fields of genetically engineered plants, and I looked at these bananas, and I said, what are you doing? They looked at me and grinned and said, they're golden bananas. I said, what are you? I can see they're golden. But what does that mean? They said, well, we did what you did with rice. We put the same genes into the banana. 
Because the problem is that Ugandan children are weaned by mushy banana. Mushy banana tastes good. It's got sugar and carbohydrate and a lot of potassium in it, but it doesn't have any vitamin A in it at all. And we're seeing now, and I think this is also interesting, we're seeing a lot of investment now by governments and by public money into genetically engineered plants. This is another example in Uganda where there's a terrible disease called wilt of bananas, where they got the genes from Academia Sinica in Taiwan, they put them into the banana and it's working. But the money comes from the Ugandan government and there's some money from the British government and the American government as well. It's not, this is not Monsanto doing it. This is public research in the National Agricultural Research Organization of Uganda. And the products will be freely available. I'm not going to talk about that. I'll spend too much time on it. But all these technologies are fine, but they only work if there are markets. And you need markets that are fair and efficient, and whereby poor farmers can get the seed and fertilizer they need and can sell the products at the end. This is northern Ghana again. There's a research institute called the Savannah Agricultural Research Institute been there for some time, but it's now really beginning to have a big impact. And the, the farmer in the middle there, who's the head farmer of a farm association, I said to him, how are you doing? He said, well, my soybean crop is now much better because the people at the Savannah Research Institute told me how I could improve what I was doing. And as a result, I got two banks per, act, per acre more than I had before. It was really good, he said. He explained what it was that they told him. It was fairly simple things, and it worked. His farmer association now buys its grain because one of the recommendations was that you should have certified seed, right? You need a can of seed, which on the label tells you what the seed's going to do, instead of any old junk you might buy in the market otherwise. So they go to the dealer, called an agro-dealer, in the local village or nearby, and buy the seeds that they're going to plant. And the farmer associations negotiate with the agro-dealers. And then in the bottom right, when they've harvested the soybean, they're putting it in bags, you can't read the label there, but it says Savannah Farmers Marketing Company. They're all part of a marketing company which in turn sells the soybean and bargains again with the buyers. And the company is also now building a warehouse to put it. So that farmer in the middle there is part of a marketing organization. And this is what it looks like now what that marketing organization looks like. Over there on the left, you can see the farmer in the middle, inside a farmer association of some kind. Off there is an agro-dealer, usually a woman in a village shop who sells seed and fertilizer and also sells microcredit. And she gets the seed from a seed company, a local seed company that's been created. And there's a large number of seed companies. There are th thousands of agro-dealers now in Eastern and Southern Africa, and large numbers of seed companies. And then at the other end, the farmers are selling to traders. And to do that, they mostly are organized in co-ops or in farmer groups or in some other kind of organization, so they've got some muscle when they want to sell their grain. And they sell the grain to the local trader, and it goes into regional and national tr trade. And most important is connectivity. Most important in all of this. And there are two kinds of connectivity. One, of course, is roads, all-weather, all-year roads. 
and the other is soft connectivity, mobile phones, ICT. And technically, we call that an enabling environment. And that's, in many ways, what's lacking. It's not just the technology. It's the enabling environments that's successful. And then, of course, we also need people. We need people who will drive the change and people who will embrace the change. There are about half a billion smallholders in the world. And for the next 20, 30 years, it's they who will be producing the food that we need. There will be big farms as well, and they will become more of them. But it's the small holder, the farmer with less than two hectares of land, that's going to be important. And many of those farmers are women. And we need to see much more engagement from government organisations, from NGOs, from the private sector, with women. Partly, of course, because women are farmers, large numbers of them. Also because they're mothers. In other words, they don't just grow the nutritious food, they make sure the children have the nutritious food. And many of them, particularly in Africa, are bright scientists and innovators. Top right there is Dafros Gahakwa. I took a picture of her when she was uh, director of biotechnology in Uganda. That's that picture. I often show this picture when I'm talking in Africa. I say, you know, there's many great women biotechnologists in Africa. I said, here's one of the Froze Gahakwa. And I said that in Rwanda. I was giving a talk like this in front of an audience. Everybody started burst, burst laughing at me. I said, why are they all laughing at the froze? And then they said, look down the front. And there was the froze sat in the front row. I said, what are you doing here? And she said, I'm the Minister of Agriculture. And when we knew her in Uganda, we gave her a fellowship to go off and do a biotechnology training. I don't know whether we thought she was Ugandan. I thought she was Ugandan. She wasn't. She was Rwandan. She was a Rwandan refugee. And she went back to Rwanda, and there she was, Minister of Agriculture. Bottom right, smart, young, Ugandan woman I saw just recently. And she's pointing out to me those Petri dishes. And she said, do you know what's in that Petri dish? I said, no, I don't know what's in there. She said, that's double haploid cassava. Well, of course, you know, we could have another lecture about what is double haploid cassava, except it's a really powerful tool for plant breeding with cassava. And as far as we can make out, she's the first person to have produced it. Bottom left over here, a wonderful woman called Maria Andrade, who comes from the Cape Verde Islands, but has spent the last 20 years working on orange-fleshed sweet potatoes. And everything she does is curry colored orange. I mean, the trucks are orange. In fact, I, I don't quite know why she's not wearing it. She must be going to a funeral. She normally wears orange all the time. And she is just uh, fantastic. And she's really made this change in Mozambique and elsewhere. And another remarkable woman, woman um, uh, Josephine Ocott, who's an Acholi woman from northern Uganda. And many of you will know the history of the Acholi people is pretty rough in that part of the world. And she created something called Victoria Seed. She created a seed company. She's, um, I don't know, late 30s, 40 or so. And I've got to know her quite well. And she said to me the other day, she said, you know, I got up early and I went out to the, to the warehouse. And it was just before 6 o'clock in the morning. And the farmers were in a long line to buy seed that early in the morning. That's the kind of impact they're having, producing excellent certified seed. People are at the heart of what I call a virtuous circle. If you start um, uh, two o'clock over there, with agricultural development you get greater yields. The farmers are more prosperous. There's more wage labour as a result. There's less hunger. The rural economy grows, 
There's more rural employment, more roads and markets, greater trade opportunities, agriculture develops, and it keeps going round and round. The point here is that agriculture is at the heart of rural development. And that, in turn, is at the heart of overall development. We have to keep remembering that all the countries in the world have gone through an agricultural revolution before their industrial revolution. Actually, the, the British Minister for Development once said to me, he said, aren't there any countries that have done it without going through agriculture? I said, yes, there's one. He said, oh, great, what is it? I said, Singapore. <laughs> it's virtually the only country in the world that's gone to industrial development without having agricultural development as well. It's what we had in Britain, it's what you had here in the United States, it's what happened in Japan, it's what happened in Korea, it's what happened in China and elsewhere. The big trick is to make it much quicker, not to wait 100 years for the agricultural revolution then 100 years for the industrial revolution, but to make it compact, to get the two things to go together. And I think agriculture is part of that mix to make it all happen. But you also need political leadership. Does everybody recognize who it is? Ghanaians in the audience, are there? Mm, don't see any. John Kufour, president of Ghana from 2002 to 2009. He created an investment environment whereby there were big opportunities for investment in agriculture, and in particular in roads and in research. As a result, the production of cocoa went up, the production of cassava and yams, basic foodstuffs, went up. Agriculture grew at 5% per year. 20 years of it. 5% per year agricultural GDP. Rural incomes virtually doubled. And most important, because of the underlying narrative of what I've been saying, child malnutrition, that's the uh, orange bars there, under fives, under, under weight, went down from 30% in 1988 to only 70% in 2008. Ghana is going to achieve the Millennium Development Goal of halving hunger by 2015. It'll be the first African country to do it. And what I'm saying on the basis of this, on the basis of everything I've been saying in the lecture, is that we know what to do. Not going to be easy, but we know what to do. And the final thing is, we should just get on and do it. Thank you. I'd like to take a couple of questions. Yeah, sure. Good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, Professor uh, Conway will now take a couple of questions. We do have time, so uh, go right ahead, right to the left here. Oh, I, I don't think it's great. I, I'm not sure what the proportion is. Uh, no, I've asked. Katie, is my, who's sitting down here, she should wave her hand. Uh, she's my researcher, and she's written, written a lot about the book. So whenever somebody asks a question like that, I look to her, and she says no. She doesn't know. Uh, it's not, I mean, a lot of the palm oil, of course, goes for margarine and other edible oils. So if we switched out of palm oil for biodiesel, I don't think it would be so great. What is interesting is, if I might say it, is that the European Commission is about, or the European Union is about to uh, insist that only half of biofuel crops are food crops. Uh, we'll see what happens. It's not going to be easy because the, the, the producers of biofuels are already geared up to using uh, oilseed rape and so on. Do you, do you know the answer to the question yourself? Sometimes people who ask questions know the answer. <laughs> Anybody else know what it is? 
Or Come on, it says Cornell. Oh, Bob knows. No, I don't, I don't oh. know the answer to that question. I know the answer to another question. <laughs> Bob, Bob, you, Bob, Bob used to work for me at the Rockefeller Foundation, and he was like this all the time. I think most people don't know that 40% of the U.S. corn crop mm. is, is turned into ethanol. Yeah. 40%. That's more than that is used for feed in the U.S. The rest of it is exported. And it's, that's right. And it's not that clear that when you do all the calculations, it really is reducing greenhouse gases. It, it's so iffy. We could have a big argument about it. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's really telling. Uh, shall, I, um, shall I manage all these people? Please. Sorry, I'm drinking this. I didn't know it was, it was behind the computer screen. I can see it. Thanks for laying out all those different solutions. I'm just wondering, um, given the, the need to do more with less, as you were saying, all the, those enormous challenges you laid out, I was wondering if you thought there was a role for any sort of more demand-side solutions, yeah. particularly that the political leadership could get involved in. Can, can we all go on eating a lot of steak every week or every day of the week throughout the entire world? Or is this well, I, I, I don't think we can go on doing that, but I don't know, to be honest, how you change it. Uh, in Britain, I get asked that question. They say, we could all become vegetarians in Britain. I say, great, it won't matter a damn, you know, because that's not where all the meat is being consumed. Uh, there's a lot being consumed in the United States, but there's a lot being consumed in China. Half of all the pig meat in the world, pork and pig meat, is consumed in China. There's large amounts now being consumed in India, despite religious uh, beliefs. And a huge amount in Brazil. I mean, those of you who are from Brazil or visited South America, you know what meat eating is like. But I don't think any of that will change unless there's a change in the pricing. No, you, you have to get the price of meat and other livestock products to reflect the real cost of producing them. And that cost is not just the amount of feed, but it's where the feed comes from and its impacts and the environmental impacts and the greenhouse gas impacts. Because the problem, of course, is that livestock produce methane. And methane is much more powerful as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. I think we're going to have to change, but we're only going to be able to change if we get the pricing up. But if all of you would like to become vegetarians or cut your amount of meat by so much percent, I think that's good. I think we have to get to that frame of mind because then we'll be able to put up with the fact when the government comes along and says, you're going to have to do this. You know, the really, sorry, I'm, going to, I'm getting out into another whole lecture here, but the the really critical thing is whether we can, and this is a, a big question for all of you here in the States and for all of us in Europe, whether we can achieve a sustainable world with the impact of climate change, and it looks like we're going to four degrees above pre-industrial instead of two, and at the same time complete, retain a completely free market democratic society. I don't know the answer to that, but there's going to have to be much more central direction about what we do if we're going to survive, or not us, of course, but our children and grandchildren. You see? Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think it's very great to fight for the invisible hunger. I mean, that, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, besides this kind of genetically modified technology, golden rice, can we have a, another traditional, more traditional approach to this? Well, I understand what you're saying. What many people say is, why don't we feed children with carrots and all the rest of those things, and then they'll get the vitamin A they need, right? The fruit. But they've got to be able to eat it. And the critical period is the weaning period. You know, when, when the child comes off the mother's milk, where the child's getting vitamin A from the mother's milk, and, and there's a period 
you know, little babies don't start eating bananas and, and, and carrots for quite a while. I've noticed that. I mean, it's a long way on. And that's the problem. Now, you need the production of different crops, different varieties of plants, uh, lovely plants that you all eat because you, you, know, you, you eat these wonderful salads which are full of plants with exotic names and so on. And you eat those and you get lots of vitamins and everything else. That's great. But if you're in a, living in a slum in Mumbai or wherever else, and all you do is eat rice with a little bit of dried fish in it, a little tiny bit of dried fish, about that much, right? You don't get all those fruits. And so it's, it, there's not an easy solution to it. And that's why we need uh, bananas and, and, and maize and rice that have been uh, bred to produce more vitamin A or iron or whatever it is. In most cases, we can do it by natural means. When I say natural, I don't mean natural at all. That was the silliest thing to say. By conventional means, by conventional breeding. Often quite sophisticated conventional breeding, but we can do it. But in some cases, you can't do it by conventional breeding, and then you need genetic modification. OK, please. Yeah. Hey, thank you, sir. Uh, it was really interesting. I have one question, especially concerning these kind of short-term um, food spikes or food yeah. spikes. How do you see um, food speculation in, in this process? I think you touched it briefly. Well, yeah, there's, there's a lot of argument about it, and I'm not a specialist on it. But what is interesting is that banks have been selling financial instruments that you can buy which effectively bet on the price of, of food. Uh, that's not a bet on how much food will be produced, but on the price of food. And the price of food is often due to other factors. And the European banks have all decided to stop, to stop uh, selling those financial instruments, which I think is quite indicative of the fact that they're worried that this may be accelerating the spikes. And it may be that because that's happened, the spike is not going up as great as it was. But, you know, this is, you can do hundreds of PhDs on what's the cause of food price spikes. Well. Thank you, sir. Um, I have a question about, so in your lecture, you talk people, technology, market, and also political layers. They Great. Influence, Good. They could influence food, uh, food security. So my question would be, I think the complicated part in reality is those four factors are interacting with each yeah. other. So which way do you think is the best to try to cooperate those four factors together to contribute for our objective to feed people in the whole world? Or could you give some example, like a successful practice? That's a very good question. How do you put these four things together? Uh, innovation and markets and people and political leadership. I think you first of all have to recognize that you've got to work on all of them at once. By the way, that's a general message in the book. You shouldn't just be working on productivity and then adding in the environment or adding in women or adding in resilience. You've got to have it right there at the beginning. Women aren't add-ons. I know most of the women in the audience know that. But they aren't add-ons to any program. You've got to work on them from the beginning. Now, I think what that means is that you have to have a strategy for dealing with food security at a national level and at a world level that brings those together and that you have to get the right kind of balance of investment. The most interesting thing that's happened this week is I gave this talk. Yeah. Carry on. It's all right. <laughs> Somebody leant against the switch. I, I have a certain nervousness about this because when I was at the Rockefeller Foundation in New York, I was giving a great big talk like this to all my staff with my PowerPoint going. My PowerPoint came on with all these wonderful pictures and the lights went all out. You know, and the whole audience of my staff said, ah, typical of you. you 
fuse the lights. So I said, somebody go and fix the lights. Somebody said, no, look, look out the window. All the lights down Fifth Avenue had gone out. Then somebody else said they'd gone out in Canada too. And I thought, my PowerPoints are really powerful. <laughs> the, the most Im interesting thing that happened this week is I gave a talk at DFID. DFID is the Department for International Development in the UK. It's a bit like USAID. And it was chaired by the permanent secretary, who's uh, the, the sort of senior civil servant in the British, uh, the British government for international development. We're not like you in the States. We don't have many politicians. We just try and keep only, I mean, we have only a few because it's the civil servants that run the country. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not, I'm not going to argue with you, but that's what we do. And he said to me, and he said it openly in front of everybody else, what you've done in this book is provide us with this strategic approach that we desperately need because we've been doing this and that, little things about food security. We've done a bit about this and a bit about that and a bit about the other. And clearly that isn't enough. You've got to work together at it. Madam. So what do you see as the future of transnational corporations in seed technology? Ha. Huh. Well, they will have, an they will have a, a continuing increase. There's no doubt about that. Um, what is interesting about the transnationals, the big corporations, is that although they are focusing apparently on genetic engineering and on GM seeds, what they're actually doing is investing in conventional technology. There's a huge, it's virtually industrial style research into producing new varieties of soybean, maize and cotton, which are the main ones, uh, which have got a whole range of of good features to them, and that will continue. But what we're also seeing is the growth of seed companies in, in uh, developing countries, particularly in India, for example, very good seed company there. There are now these good seed companies that are developing in Africa, like, uh, uh, Victor like Josephine Ocott's Victoria Seeds that I described, and they are going to become increasingly important. And they are getting a must of their technology for genetics from the International Agricultural Research Institutes around the world, the institutes of the CGIAR, the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, institutes like the Wheat and Maize Institute in, in Mexico or the Rice Institute in the Philippines. So we're going to see a, a world where there are seeds coming from lots of different sources. And it's basically the best seeds and the cheapest seeds are the ones that are going to win. I, we're not seeing a takeover by the international corporations of seeds. There's an awful lot of seed production going on now in developing countries. I think we're almost at the end of our time. Uh, so, Gordon, there are a number of organizations that have come together to uh, sponsor your visit today. The, many people in the audience here are uh, from SIPA. Right. Uh, and of course, we have faculty from our College of Agriculture. I see our various associate deans and, and faculty from the College of Agriculture. Uh, we also have uh, individuals from the IPCALS, uh, International Programs in CALS. So, so we all have come uh, to welcome you. And there are a number oh. of small gifts here. We know that you travel light these days. <laughs> but it's a little something on behalf of Cornell University to you for this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much.